the Northeast Mississippi Community College Humanities Teacher of the Year Lecture. Thank you, faculty, administration, students, and the Boonville community for your attendance tonight. Our winner for the year 2020 <coughs> is Dr. Amanda Maddox of Fine Arts, and she will be presenting the topic, Coming to America, How Immigrant Composers Have Enriched Our Musical Culture. We have some very special guests with us this evening, Dr. Pre uh, President Dr. Ricky Ford and Vice President Craig Ellis Sasser and Ms. Carol Anderson, the Assistant Director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. I would like to thank all of them for their support for the Cultural Arts Program and to invite Ms. Anderson to the stage to say a few words about the Humanities Council. for her outstanding teaching here at Northeast Mississippi Community College. Every year, we recognize a Humanities Teacher Award winner at every one of our state's colleges and universities. And the awardee is then asked to present a lecture on a humanities-related subject of their choice. <coughs> they also receive a cash award, and they are our honored guest at our annual awards gala, which will be held this year on March 27th in Jackson, where we will be publicly recognizing all of our teacher winners for their achievements. At the Humanities Council, we believe it's important to recognize the excellence of humanities teachers and to highlight the importance of the humanities to create um, an engaged and informed citizenry. At the Humanities Council, we believe that the humanities are for everyone. And this is true both for students here at Northeast Mississippi Community College and for people in Boonville and everywhere across our state. The Council is an independent nonprofit organization supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and also by grants and donations from private foundations, from corporations, and individuals. The Council, in turn, supports and develops a wide range of programs across the state that help us explore our rich history and our culture. And we create opportunities for Mississippians to learn more about themselves and the larger world and enrich our communities through civil conversations by promoting lifelong learning in our state. And we would like to invite all of you to join us in this work. I invite you to look at our website, mshumanities.org, or follow us on Facebook, book, Twitter, or Instagram to learn more about us and our programs. Thank you. In her 25th year here at Northeast Mississippi <coughs> Community College, Dr. Amanda Maddox is a member of the Fine Arts faculty, teaching flute, <coughs> music theory, and music appreciation. During her first 10 years at Northeast, she was an assistant band director and color guard instructor, and she was named a top, which is teaching the outstanding performance, teacher in 2007 through the Northeast Development Foundation and was Northeast Headway, which is Higher Education Appreciation Day, Working for Academic Excellence recipient in 2013. Along with being this year's Humanities Teacher of the Year, she was also named as a finalist for the Mississippi Virtual Community College Instructor of the Year Award. During her tenure, she served as an officer for the Northeast Faculty Association and she's currently serving on the Quality Enhancement Plan Task Force and the Institutional Effectiveness Committee, as well as the Executive Institutional Effectiveness Committee. Dr. Maddox has been a flutist for the North Mississippi Symphony Orchestra since 1998, and she plays the flute and leads the handbell choir at Gaston Baptist Church. She holds an Associate of Arts from NEMCC, a Bachelor of Music Education from Mississippi State a Bachelor's of Science in Math, and a Master of Music Education from the University of Southern Miss, and the Doctorate of Arts degree in Flute Pedagogy from the University of Mississippi. She's married to Mike Maddox, and they have two daughters, Erin and Lauren. She is the daughter of Jackie Murphy and the late Jimmy Murphy. 
After a conversation with her students, she quickly realized why this, she's this year's award winner. However, she wasn't nominated for the way she conducts class. She was nominated because she never stops learning. She leads by example, and she was willing to take on a project working with our office and e-learning to save her colleagues time and energy as they track student learning and student success in music appreciation. She has mastered yes and with her students and with her colleagues. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Amanda Maddox on her award and welcoming her to the stage. Remember, remember always that all of us are descended from immigrants and revolutionists. President Franklin D. Roosevelt made this statement in a 1938 address to the Daughters of the American Revolution. In this speech, he asked them to remember what had brought their revolutionary ancestors to this country to help them understand what was impelling immigrants at that time to leave their homes and come to America. One of the most debated topics in recent history is immigration. Immigration is the act of coming into a country of which one is not a native for permanent residence. This is not necessarily a presentation concerning politics or policy. Instead, it considers how certain immigrants have affected the musical culture of America. Tonight, we will look at this list of composers, most of whom came to America from Europe because of oppressive political situations. With one exception, all became US citizens. While this lecture cannot adequately describe the effects of these particular people on our culture, hopefully it will make us more aware of how our American musical experience has been enhanced by their contributions. President John F. Kennedy said, immigrants everywhere have enriched and strengthened the fabric of American life. Tonight, I invite you to listen and consider how American music has been enriched and strengthened. Now, will you please stand for the playing of the national anthem? <laughs> Conservatory in 1892. You might say he was as Russian as someone could possibly be. However, that was his arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner. Very difficult, by the way. I'm not really a piano player, but I wanted you to hear it because it's of his rich harmonies that are just um, only Rachmaninoff if you're familiar with his music. 
But what led him to arrange the most American of songs? Rachmaninoff's family fled Russia because of the Russian Revolution in 1917. He received an offer to perform in Scandinavia, and he used this as an excuse to leave Russia with his family. And during that tour in 1918, he received offers from the United States. One was to become conductor of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra for two years, or to conduct 110 concerts in 30 weeks for the Boston Symphony, and three, to give 26 piano recitals. All of these he declined, worrying about such a big commitment in a new country. However, he considered the United States financially advantageous because he knew he couldn't support his family through composition alone. After receiving donations from friends and admirers, he and his family moved to America in November 1918. Soon after arriving, he hired an assistant as a secretary, interpreter, and to help him deal with American life. He also hired a booking agent who arranged 36 performances for the 1918-1919 season. Before the tour began, he had offers from many piano manufacturers to tour with their instruments. He decided on Steinway, uh, incidentally the only company not to offer him money. He opened the first concert of this tour and many later performances with his arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner. Rachmaninoff was able to become financially secure and live an upper middle class life in New York City with servants and tailored suits and the latest model cars. He came to the US and enjoyed the spoils of capitalism, yet continued entertaining <coughs> Russian guests, hiring Russian help, and speaking Russian. Some might say he rejected American values because he maintained his Russianness, but possibly the freedom offered here gave him the opportunity to hold to his traditions and bring more to our American culture by what he shared. Rachmaninoff felt deep devotion to the United States and once said, this is the only place on earth where a human being is respected for what he is and what he does, and it does not matter who he is and where he came from. If you're curious about how often his music has been used in our recent American history, you should look him up on imdb.com. He has uh, 206 credits to his, uh, or 206 soundtrack credits. Of course, this is just a screenshot of the most recent. I don't know if you're familiar with that site, but they go on and on. Many of his, much of his music has been used over and over again. And in fact, um, the second movement of, of his piano concerto number two that was playing in the background was, um, the inspiration for All By Myself that was written by Eric Carmen in 1975. That's covered many times by several people and probably the, one of the most famous you would be familiar with or you younger folks would be Celine Dion. You probably recognize her before Eric Carmen. I think she still sings that on tour, by the way. <laughs> Obviously, Rachmaninoff has made an impact on American culture. As, as much as Rachmaninoff was Russian, Bela Bartok was Hungarian. He was a composer, pianist, and teacher, and known to most music students as the first ethnomusicologist. Bartok dedicated years to tracking down original folk tunes from tiny villages in Hungary and Romania. Together with fellow composer Zoltan Kodai, Bartok recorded original folk tunes on a bulky Edison phonograph, and this is a the slide shows a, a picture, a somewhat famous picture if you're a music history student, of Bartok recording folk songs from a windowsill in a peasant village in 1907. It's not great quality, but he has the phonograph there in the window. He also notated these songs, and by 1918 he had collected more than 9,000. Some say that his work preserved an entire culture. And his later compositions were greatly influenced by his work. And they're filled with folk elements of Hungary and Eastern Europe. After spending most of his life in Europe, he began having a great deal of trouble with the Hungarian government because of his anti-fascist political views. He and his wife immigrated to the US in October 1940. Bartok had secured a grant from Columbia University for ethnomusicological research. 
However, his concert career collapsed, and he began having financial difficulty. Bartok also declined physically and was eventually diagnosed with leukemia. He refused to teach composition, including highly paid positions offered by the Juilliard and Curtis schools. Privately, ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Art Authors, and Publishers, paid for his doctors and medications, nurses, and even a better apartment. Bartok was sick and hospitalized when Sergei Kusevitsky, music director of the Boston Symphony, commissioned this concerto for orchestra. He rallied physically and produced what some call one of the greatest success stories of modern music. The Boston performances were considered uh, superb and were extremely well received. In addition to the concerto for orchestra, he composed sonata for unaccompanied violin and his third piano concerto while he was terminally ill and being supported by other people. Joseph Horowitz wrote in his book, <coughs> Artists in Exile, Rarely has concert music of such quality and enduring interest been composed on American soil. Sadly, at the appearing of American commissions and American fame, Bartok died. At his funeral, a separate room was required for the number of journalists. By 1948 to 49, his works were more performed by American orchestras than those of any 20th century composer except Strauss and Prokofiev. Bartok's Hungarian heritage brought another layer of musical texture to American concert music. Igor Stravinsky was another Russian composer, pianist, and conductor. He first became known for his ballets, um, Firebird, Petrushka, and The Rite of Spring. He took his family and left Russia for Switzerland during World War I, and due to the Russian Revolution in 1917, he was unable to return. He began struggling financially because he had a hard time collecting money from the ballet Russe for his works. He spent 1920 to 1939 in France, and during this time developed professional relationships with influential people in the United States. He visited the U.S. during this time, in 1925 as guest conductor of the New York Philharmonic, and later that same season he performed his piano concerto with the Boston Symphony, the New York Philharmonic, and elsewhere. In 1939, he arrived in the U.S. after a terrible year of losing his older daughter, wife, and mother, all to tuberculosis in one year. Upon arriving in the States, he delivered the prestigious Charles Eliot Norton Lectures at Harvard during the 39-40 academic year. But eventually, he was drawn to Los Angeles, especially during World War II, where many other musicians, composers, and conductors settled. He and his second wife, Vera, became U.S. citizens in 1945. <coughs> and that same day, he arranged for Boozy and Hawks to publish his, several of his compositions. And it was his face on the cover of Time magazine in 1948, and um, part of the writing was that he was one of the century's great composers. This famous image of Stravinsky comes with another story of the, an arrangement of the national anthem. In January 1944, Stravinsky performed his arrangement of the anthem with the Boston Symphony. However, the audience was shocked, shocked at the unconventional harmonies. Unfortunately, he was altering the anthem at a time during war when no one was interested in altering the traditional harmonies of the Star Spangled Banner. The rumor of Stravinsky being arrested for his arrangement has been floating around for over half a century now. But the real story is that the Boston police did warn Stravinsky, and this is kind of ridiculous to us, but they warned him not to perform his arrangement on a concert that would be broadcast over national radio. Their case was based on a decades-old Massachusetts law that prohibited the, the performance of the Star Spangled Banner as dance music, as part of a medley, or with embellishment, like a dominant seventh chord. <laughs> <laughs> Stravinsky conceded to their wishes and switched to the Boston Symphony's traditional arrangement for that evening's performance. The truth is the police never intended to arrest him or interrupt the performance, <coughs> but they might have issued a complaint and they could have charged him, uh, fined him $100. The story behind the photo is that it's probably an ID photo. 
um, for a visa. ID photos could be made at the police department at the time, and the date of April 15, 1940 coincides when he would be having visa issues. Listen to this ending of his arrangement. I'm not going to play the entire Star Spangled Banner again, but I want you to hear the ending, see what you think. Massachusetts, anyway. I think they have a lot of strange laws. <laughs> More positive highlights from Stravinsky's mu musical output in America include Disney using excerpts of The Rite of Spring in their animated film Fantasia. A Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus commissioned a ballet for elephants called Circus Polka, and I think I read that they used 50 elephants with uh, ballet ball with ballerinas on their backs. There would have been something to see. And he also had dinner at the White House with John F. Kennedy. And a year after Kennedy's assassination, Stravinsky composed and directed Elegy for JFK to mark the anniversary of the president's death. Stravinsky has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and he was posthumously awarded the Grammy Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1987. Stravinsky has left his unique mark on American culture. Arnold Schoenberg was born into a lower middle class family in Vienna. The son of a shopkeeper, Schoenberg was largely self-taught as a musician. He was very successful as a composer and teacher until he lost his job at the Prussia Academy of Arts in Berlin with the rise of Nazism. They labeled his works as degenerate because he was Jewish. So he immigrated to the U.S. and then returned to the Jewish faith which he had abandoned in his youth. Uh, Schoenberg Americanized himself and was known to listen to football games on the radio, and he used the expression, take it easy, <laughs> somewhat cool. <laughs> <laughs> he held major, te major teaching positions at USC and UCLA, and the main concert venue for UCLA is Schoenberg Hall. He lived across the street from Shirley Temple and became friends and tennis partners with George Gershwin. Guests to his famous Sunday afternoon gatherings included Los Angeles Philharmonic music director Otto Klipper, composers Edgar Varese and Ernst Toke, and comedian actor Harpo Marx. So his 12 tone technique that you're hearing in his piano concerto, opus 42 has been one of the most influential of 20th century music. It won't last long, obviously. Through this method of treating all 12 tones of the chromatic scale equally, Schoenberg invited audiences to think analytically. Interestingly, as much as musicologists and music historians like to talk about Schoenberg and his 12-tone writings, they're rarely performed. And it's because many composers have such strong feelings against it. However, no one can argue that his work didn't make people think. And his books, including The Theory of Harmony and Fundamentals of Musical Composition, are still in print and used by developing composers and musicians. Music theory students who are here, you can get these on Amazon. Get on your phones after this program and order away. Antonin Dvorak, composer and organist, was one of the first Czech composers to achieve worldwide recognition. Borjak did not spend time in the U.S. because of political, the political climate of his homeland, nor did he ever become a U.S. citizen, the only one in tonight's program that didn't. He wanted to discover American music, and his contributions to our musical culture are why I included him. 
Dvorkjot came to the United States as the director of the National Conservatory of Music. At the urging of his wife, he took this position in 1892 for the then staggering annual salary of $15,000. And that was 1892. I think that's the equivalent of what, maybe $350,000, something like that. So his wife urged him to take that job, and he did. <laughs> One of his great triumphs was his Symphony No. 9 from the New World, which was commissioned by the New York Philharmonic in 1893. To quote jo Joseph Horowitz again, he considers Dvorak's New World Symphony to be the best known work of its kind ever composed in the United States. Listen to this short excerpt from the fourth movement of his ninth symphony. <laughs> Thank you. 
and in the 1920s, he gained the attention of an international audience with his compositions. However, his music fell in and out of favor with the Nazi regime. When his writing was more tonal, they felt he was a strong example of modern German composer. When he wrote more avant-garde avant works, he was described as an atonal noisemaker, and the government condemned his, quote, degenerate music. Because his wife was partially Jewish, they immigrated to Switzerland in 1938 and the U.S. in 1940. Once in the United States, he taught primarily at Yale University. And his students include composers Lucas Foss, Norman Del Joyo, and Samuel Adler. While at Yale, he founded the Yale Collegium Musicum, which is an ensemble dedicated to the historically accurate performance of early music. And that series at Yale is ongoing with regular performances and lectures throughout the school year. In 1946, Robert Shaw and the Robert Shaw Chorale commissioned him to write a piece based on the Walt Whitman poem, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. The poem mourned the passing of Abraham Lincoln, and the Robert Shaw Chorale commissioned the work after the 1945 death of President Roosevelt. He continued combining his German influence with the American ideal. Symphonic Metamorphosis of Themes by Carl Maria von Weber, which you're hearing, is possibly his most popular work and was written during his time in the U.S. Another important work written during his U.S. stay is Symphony in B-flat, which is a cornerstone piece of wind band literature. Hindemith wrote the piece for the U.S. Army Band and premiered it with them in 1951. His influence on American music is undeniable and continues to this day. Okay, just a show of hands. I don't know that I can see you, but who has ever heard of Eric Korngold? I don't see anybody. That's what I was wondering. Probably the least familiar name on the list. Um, but he was a child prodigy from Austria, was a pianist, composer, and conductor. And his operas and other compositions brought him fame in Vienna. During the 1930s, he visited the U.S to work for Warner Brothers on a film version of A Midsummer Night's Dream with Max Reinhardt, an Austrian director. He also composed the music for another Warner Brothers film, Captain Blood, which launched the career of Errol Flynn and boosted that of Olivia de Havilland. This score received an Oscar nomination. Next, he composed the original score for Anthony Adverse in 1936, which earned him his first Academy Award for original score. Korngold was back in Austria when Warner Brothers asked him to return to Hollywood and compose the score for The Adventures of Robin Hood in, for 1938, again starring Flynn and Haviland. He earned his second Academy <coughs> Award for original score for this film. Now, while in Hollywood working on this project, the Nazis invaded, and his home in Vienna was confiscated. Korngold said that the opportunity to compose the score for Robin Hood saved his life. And this is it. He stayed in the U.S. until after World War II, and it's safe to say that he set the stage for film scoring for action movies in the U.S. His music has begun to receive long overdue recognition, with John Williams stating that Korngold was his inspiration in scoring the Star Wars series. So now you've heard of him and his music. <laughs> Irving Berlin was born in Russia as Israel Balin and immigrated to New York with a very different story from the other composers mentioned tonight. His family home was deliberately burned to the ground in an act of state-sponsored discrimination by the Russian government. His family came to the United States in the late 19th century, as did many other Jewish families. Upon their arrival on Ellis Island on September 14, 1893, five-year-old Israel was put in a pen with his brother and five sisters until immigration officials declared them fit to be allowed into the city. They were one of hundreds of thousands of Jewish families who immigrated to the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s to escape discrimination and poverty. 
Berlin dropped out of school at the age of 13 with the, around the time his father died. His only skill was singing, so he sang on the streets of the Lower East Side. He became streetwise, but he also learned what kind of songs people like to listen to. He, his talent earned a job at a saloon named Jimmy Kelly's in the Union Square neighborhood. Through his connections there, he got a big break as a staff lyricist with the Ted Snyder Company, one of the largest music publishers of popular sheet music in the country. Berlin quickly became popular through his songwriting on Tin Pan Alley and Broadway. His first world-famous hit was Alexander's Ragtime Band. Following his own performance of this song in 1911, he became an instant celebrity. His song gave ragtime music a new life and sparked a national dance craze. And ironically, Russia also experienced this huge popularity of ragtime. After his young bride of only six months died in 1912, he wrote his first ballad, When I Lost You. It was immediately popular and sold more than a million copies. Developing his own style, he wrote hundreds of songs during the 19-teens. He was drafted into the Army in World War I, but returned to Tin Pan Alley after the war. And I've listed some of his greatest hits on the screen. What'll I do, always, blue skies, putting on the Ritz, there's no business like show business, and white Christmas, and many, many others. One of the highlights of his contributions is God Bless America, which was first performed by Kate Smith in 1938. Berlin made the statement, to me, God Bless America was not just a song, but an expression of my feeling toward the country to which I owe what I have and what I am. It quickly became a second national anthem after America entered World War II a few years later. This idea has persisted until today, partly because of its beauty and partly because it's so singable. In 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower awarded Berlin a special Congressional Gold Medal for writing the song. Berlin's successful career, long successful career, he lived to be 101, with a catalog of more than 1,000 songs, maybe one of America's great success stories. Europe's loss was America's gain. George Gershwin called him the greatest songwriter that ever lived. And Jerome Kern said, Irving Berlin has no place in American music. He is American music. Now that we have surveyed the American stories of these great composers, listen to this account told by President Ronald Reagan. I received a letter just before I left office from a man. I don't know why he wrote it, but I'm glad he did. He wrote that you can go to live in France, but you can't become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany, in Italy, but you can't become a German, an Italian. He went on through Turkey, Greece, Japan, and other <coughs> countries. But he said anyone from any corner of the world can come to live in the United States and become an American. And what I have taken from my reading and research is that all of these composers and countless others not mentioned brought their own histories, their own experiences, their own sound, and all of that, to, all of that together has become American music. You can't extract anyone's contribution without taking away something from the whole. Our musical culture is what it is because of America and everything and every person that makes up our country, however and whenever we arrived. What we have is unique. It shouldn't be divisive. It's our story. We should remember it. We should cultivate what we have and together continue to weave a vibrant tapestry of music and culture here in our United States of America. I'm going to ask Marty to return to the stage to sing Irving Berlin's original version of God Bless America. Oh. 
thank Dr. Maddox. And I don't think that's enough. <laughs> say thank you to each and every one of you who came out tonight. Uh, and I do want to say thank you to Marty Hurt, uh, outstanding performance here in support of uh, Dr. Maddox and that fine presentation that you made tonight. So I do want to thank you for that. I do want to say thank you to Ms. Anderson for coming and representing the Mississippi Humanities Council. Uh, I do want to say how much we appreciate the students. I know Dr. Maddox mentioned to you, but without you guys, students, we would not have a job. The Northeast would not be at the level we are without students just like you. So thank you for coming out and supporting us. I want to say thank you to all the fine faculty that we have here tonight. I always call them world-class faculty because you are the heart and soul of of this institution that makes it roll. So without the great faculty, we have some of the smartest people in the world here on, on our faculty and on our staff and all of our employees. We want to say thank you for your uh, attendance here tonight. I also want to say thank you to the Humanities uh, Committee here for your uh, work in organizing this and also to commend you on your selection of Dr. Max being Humanities Teacher of the Year. And I can't go without saying, without saying thank you to the family of Dr. Maddox, Mike, Aaron, Lauren, Ms. Murphy, we want to say thank you. And thank you for sharing Dr. Maddox with us for the last 25 years. And on saying all that, thank you all for coming tonight. Hope you've enjoyed it. I want to turn it back over to Dr. Langley, and she has some instructions, I think, for you students on the surveys. Okay. Thank you all for coming. code for you um, on the bottom of your program and um, if you will turn your camera on you can scan that and a link will pop up and it will take you to the survey and there's some questions for you to answer and um, also if you are hoping to get some extra credit from a, a few teachers uh, there are teachers names that you can select that are giving credit and they will get the, the information um, that you need. Um, they'll send out an email with all the students' names who attended tonight. And um, if you have any trouble with the survey, we do have some paper copies in the front. Um, you can ask me or one of the other, other cultural art committee members for those if, if you're having trouble with your phone. And, um, also, if the teacher is not listed, you can put their name in the blank that says other. So if you don't see your teacher there, make sure that, that you do that. And thank you for coming tonight. We have a reception in honor of Dr. Maddox that's going to be in the choir room, and that is located down this hall. If you would like to attend, you're invited to join us. And thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>